Hi everyone and welcome to this latest monologue. Um, today we're discussing climate change, the politics around it and the upcoming trends that we are seeing around us. Last week I was invited to speak at a, a quite an important meeting, the Global Landscapes Forum, which happened in Nairobi, um, based at the, the ICRAF campus in Nairobi. Now this brought together all sorts of all sorts of uh, players from around the world and around Kenya, around the issues of climate change, mitigation, and conservation of the different landscapes. Now, there are a number of things that uh, that struck me at the meeting. There was the incessant, incessant talk about youth, youth and gender as aspects of climate change or climate change mitigation and it was only about Africa. There was no talk of climate change and climate impacts on youth and women in Europe or youth and women in Asia or youth and women in the Americas. It was all about the impacts of climate change and climate change mitigation on women and youth in Africa. And th this, this might have seemed strange to any lay person, but the truth is the only way Africa can properly be manipulated is by fracturing our society. That's why we even try, we have people even contending that the sun that shines on us somehow shines harder on youth and women than it does on men. Or climate change, maybe if a flood comes along, it sweeps away youth and women, but not men. The fact is our society is functioned as a unit with each demographic, each age group, each gender playing their role complementarily. And that is what has led to the sustainability of our society. That's the reason why African society is not as fractured as Western society. And this lack of fractures is what makes it very difficult now to, to try and dominate us intellectually. So they have to create those fractures in order to bring in the, the, the external dominance. Women have to be convinced that men are their adversaries, that the very men who are their sons, husbands, brothers, uncles, etc., are actually exploiting them. And this external player, savior, donor, whatever I choose to call him, is their friend who has come to save them from this plight. Even when the climate is changing all around us, all over the world, they have to be convinced that it is somehow having a more adverse effect on them than it is on men. Then there's also the aspect of youth. So many groups are brought together around Youth is not a virtue, it's just a phase of life. So many young Africans, especially young African women, are brought to the forefront because of their age and their gender. And this is, this, is a, this is something that's consciously done, and we need to be very careful that our ideas are what come out there, not our face, our skin color, our gender, our age, because those are not, those are not achievements. We do, being African is not an achievement. Um, being a woman is not an achievement. Being a man is not an achievement. Neither is being young. It's just, you're, you're just born young. So we have to be careful of this. But looking into detail at more of the sessions, you realize that the prejudices are, are, are they're working so hard to ingrain these prejudices into our society, into our policies, even into our government. Now, I'll, I'll talk about one particular session about, which was about creating low emission food systems which I thought was bizarre because traditionally our food systems are all low emissions. Most of our food systems are not mechanized even. Their subsistence, their light footprint, because simply it costs a lot of money to destroy the environment and we don't have that money and we, we don't want to waste it on that kind of thing. So we have livestock production systems like pastoralism, etc., etc. And, uh, and we have smallholder agriculture, we have use of farmyard manures, etc. But there was this session that came up and it was laid out bare. First of all, there was a Dr. Christopher Matias, the head of the climate change team at ICRAF. Uh, 
he got up on stage and actually put up a graphic that that uh, was intended to show that Kenya is performing worse than China on emissions. And this is what he was talking about. He was talking about livestock emissions. He was saying on China, he had a chart there, Kenya was at the top. It was 72% or 77% of Kenya's emissions are from livestock. And at the bottom of that chart was China, which only 14% of their emissions was from livestock. Um, it was up there just briefly. But for the lame person would say, oh my God, Kenya is doing worse than China in environment, environmental issues. But this is the, the lies around statistics. 14% um, of China's emissions is far more than 2,000% of Kenya's emissions. But you have to, the target was livestock. That we have to point a finger at Kenya's livestock because Kenya's livestock, some of the world has decided that African livestock is producing methane and greenhouse gases at unsustainable levels. So he went on to say that we we have to we have to reduce reduce our herds, and we have to we have to change the way we produce livestock. I'm not sure what we can change to something more sustainable than what we are doing now in order to meet these environmental targets. No talk whatever about our food insecurity as a nation. And, and bizarrely, these people bring out this thing of methane from livestock. In a country like Kenya, how do you decide how much methane is produced by livestock and how much is produced by elephants and wildebeest and impalas and humans even? Is there a difference in the, the methane? But he didn't, there was no Q&A because uh, such questions are questions that they, they don't have answers for. So they went on and on, and they introduced one Mr. Bernard Kimoro from, from uh, the Ministry of Livestock, heading something called Livestock Sta Sustainability. So he's, he, there's an office that's trying to make our livestock sustainable instead of increase our livestock production and improve our, our production and marketing systems. This is absolutely ridiculous. And he, and he went on to propose that we can help our rangelands by having things like biogas digesters to capture the methane. When, when we are producing pastoralist livestock production systems with cows walking 50 kilometers back and forth from pasture, who's going to walk 50 kilometers back and forth to collect their dung to put in a biogas digester? This is nonsense. And this, this, these are things that that are only geared towards things like intensive uh, feedlot type production systems that we see in Europe, um, parts of Asia, we see in the Americas. Not relevant to us at all, but as usual, Kenya is a policy vacuum, so we follow what is brought to us, as long as it's brought along with some funding. Um, there was also a lady, Elizabeth um, Okwosa from Calro, who actually verb verbatim, I'll quote, said that we cannot just go spreading manu farmyard manure on our farms. Uh, it needs to be processed into something else. I'm not sure what else, because it's contributing to greenhouse gases. And this this is a reminder of the farm bill which was brought to Kenya's parliament some time back. Again, donor donor backed, that sought to outlaw the use of farmyard manure, and these are to just improve the markets for the for artificial fertilizers. Farmyard manure is very sustainable. And the fact is, all these things are coming into Kenya government policies, into our laws, etc. because we don't want to think for ourselves. We want a donor to come with some thoughts and some money to back the thoughts. And it's high time our government came up, tried to come up with their own objectives and own ideas instead of parroting what is being fed to us by the West in the interest of markets. They want to market their seeds. They want to market their fertilizer. So the biggest enemy to the West right now in Kenya is self-sufficiency. And everything brought in here under the guise of environmental management, climate protection, etc., is supposed to compromise our self-sufficiency. Our agricultural production systems are nowhere near and environmentally unsustainable levels, nowhere near. In fact, we are a food insecure country and we are spending precious foreign exchange importing food from the same countries that produce it in environmentally unfriendly methods. We need to wake up and, 
and smell the coffee as it were and understand that we need to start doing things to meet and serve our own objectives. So it's really important that we think for ourselves wherever we are and let's not, let's always put a healthy dose of skepticism whenever any donor funded project comes in agriculture, any donor funded project comes through through NGOs and and uh, government government channels. Let's let's look first back at what we've been doing or what our neighbors, ancestors, etc., have been doing for many years and adapt that to modern times, rather than trying to create new things in an environment that has sustained us for all these millions of years without that foreign input. We must remember the West the Western approach is to compromise our self sufficiency in order to create markets and in order to create carbon sinks so that they can continue their high profitable production that is environmentally unsustainable and sell the final produce to us. So that those are my thoughts on the Global Landscape Forum. It was a good eye opener for me, but we really must wake up. And the youth don't be excited when someone pats you on the back for being young. You won't be young for forever. You'll, you'll eventually get to middle age and he'll drop you for the next young person. So youth is not a virtue. Um, gender is not a virtue. It's policy and content of what we think and do that's a virtue. And that's what will keep us sustainable or unsustainable, depending on what we do. So let's look at the reality, the real picture. Let's not look at transient circumstances because those ones just don't matter.